So introduction to HIV cure related research. You wanna uh, give me my next slide, please, Michael? So this is what we're gonna talk about, why we need an HIV cure, some of the ethical challenges, why we believe an HIV cure is possible, why it is so difficult to cure HIV and cure strategies being uh, pursued by investigators currently. Next slide, please. So what do we mean when we say cure? Language is important. So there are two main uh, pathways. A complete cure is just that. HIV is completely gone from your body. And that's the replicating cells that, uh, that cause, the, cause the problems. HIV control without daily drugs means the ability to control HIV without antiviral treatment. Okay, so two categories. Um, and you may, we may be able to get to the control part before we get to the complete part, but that's the aim. Next, please. So what kind of cure do we want? Next slide, please. We want something that's safe. I mean, we already have one pill once a day that's pretty safe, relatively safe, and relatively simple. Obviously, one pill once a day. But we, so we can't have much less than that for the long term. It, things may start off a little bit more hairy than, than one pill once a day, but we still need something that is safe, simple, affordable, which can often be a big joke in the United States of America. But, you know, we continue to work on it. Scalable, which means that it is um, accessible to everybody across the world, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, and the rest of the world as well. Complete, I just told you, something that really gets rid of HIV for good, which makes it completely gone from the body. Durable means that it lasts, that you don't have to take uh, um, uh, different treatments of whatever this intervention is once a week, once a month, once every six months. I mean, again, that may be the case initially, but the aim is to have it be one or two, three or four treatments and, and not have to be you know, something that, uh, that you're bothered with the rest of your life. And really importantly, I think it's something that prevents transmission to and from other people. I mean, I think uh, we've got this from um, uh, this particular bullet from so many people from, with HIV that they really want to be sure that whatever it is includes the inability to transmit HIV to other people or to get it from somebody else again. Okay, all righty, next please. Now, why do we need a cure? We've got one pill once a day. Next slide, please. Why do we need a cure? So, you know, I think a lot of people see an HIV cure, the thought of it as liberating for both individuals and society. Just think how nice it would be not to have to take meds every day. You know, I mean, I can't, it's hard to take a, a you know, like a, like a course of antibiotics, but if you have to take even one pill once a day, I mean, it, you're constantly reminded it is not what I would call liberating, that's for sure. Next slide, please. So, you know, and some of the really big ticket reasons why we need a cure, it's really not possible to get antiviral therapy to the over 38 million people across the world for their entire lives. I mean, I think the COVID pandemic was a really good example of Everything's stopping, people not even, it's people not being able to get any drugs, you know, including their HIV drugs. And, you know, we cannot really overcome the challenges of, of successfully taking drugs over people's entire lives. I mean, that is just over, the thought of that is overwhelming for 38 million people. I mean, how many people will stop taking their drugs for whatever reason and, and you know, end up being able, having them having their virus rebound and whatever. It's just an overwhelming sort of a sort of a, um, an idea. And the drug resistance and toxicities over time are also uh, a key item and stigma associated with um, daily antiviral therapy. I mean, anybody that's tried to take their pills while they were away for the weekend or stay having a roommate or all that sort of thing, people coming over and looking in the medicine cabinet. And I think stigma is, is always with us. Okay, next. And another main reason why main reason why we need a cure is because of the um, the attendant uh, conditions 
that are that are, that are associated with HIV infection, especially for older people who maybe didn't take HIV, excuse me, didn't take antiviral therapy immediately after they they were uh, they realized they were HIV had HIV. You know, now that's what we do. In the in the beginning, it was like, okay, well, maybe maybe I'll be okay. You know, there's some people that are, some people that can go longer before they need it. And it was a big question as to when to start, if you can believe that now. It's, it seems so long ago. But the people who start right start therapy right away seem to do better. Nevertheless, uh, a lot of these conditions are, are really attended with HIV, cardiovascular disease from chronic inflammation. Most of this stuff has to do with chronic inflammation, premature aging and frailty. I mean, it's bad enough to get old, but with HIV, I think everything comes more quickly and is more complicated. You get, you have weaker bones, you have neurologic disorders, um, you, you know, as far as memory sort of things are concerned. I mean, it's, um, as I say, it's bad enough if you don't have HIV, but uh, things are always worse, it seems. Cancer, you're at a risk for cancer over 50. And as is everybody, but it just seems to happen more um more, more often to people with HIV, diabetes, lipodystrophy. It's very, it's always, I've always thought it's ironic. You get these drugs, they work great. You can have somewhat of a normal life, but then your face looks like you have HIV. It's like, it's really unfair, but it is what it is. Plus immune exhaustion, um, which is really why people get AIDS, but sooner or later, it just flops out because it's always working. Your immune system is always working overtime. So sooner or later, it just goes boom. Okay. I mean, these are some pretty serious conditions. So, uh, I mean, I think that we it, having a cure that will take all this away, all the things I described would just be immense, just huge. Okay, next. Why do we think a cure is possible? Well, we've had five people that have been cured of HIV that we know of. Timothy Ray Brown, who we all know and love, Adam, who we're getting to know, Mark, who we're getting to know, Paul, who we're getting to know, the New York patient who would rather not get to know us um, and uh, right now, and I can understand that. You know, this, for instance, most every one of those people didn't come out that are listed up here, didn't come out right away because they're deluged with, with press and people and their lives are never the same. So, but the, the, the problem is that every one of these people had cancer. The treatment they have, the stem cell treatments that they have, that Jeff will talk a little bit more about, um, are for people that are going to die, okay? Uh, so you have people that can take one pill once a day. You cannot risk giving them giving them these transplants uh, when they have other therapies that uh, that have, you know, has keep, kept their their virus suppressed and having them having a relatively normal life if, the, if they're, you know, treated and and the virus stays that way because of antiviral therapy. Now, you know, uh, the next slide, please. Now that's people with cancer. What about everybody else? What about chronically infected people, people that have had it for years? What about people who've just gotten it? You know, these cures, while they may be, may give us hope. I mean, I think that's the important thing to remember. The idea that we could actually cure somebody uh, made it uh, made you know the, the the government spend millions in, of dollars to think about hey you know we can do this sort of thing and we can thank Tony Fauci for that but the thing the people that uh, I'm really excited about although there are few, only a few at this point are what's called exceptional elite controllers I hate that title but it, you know somebody from Harvard made it up <laughs> anyway I love Harvard but it's just a joke. Anyway, we, we many of us have heard of elite controllers, people who don't need to take HIV therapy and their virus is still, um, I don't want to say it's always suppressed, but they don't get sick. So now what we've learned is that people at Raygon, which is also, which is at Harvard, thank God for them, for the work that they've done. They found, because they've studied this in people who, uh, who haven't taken antiviral therapy, they've discovered two people Lorraine Willenberg, an old time activist from, um, actually she's, she was being treated in San Francisco, but she's from, from Sacramento. And the Esperanza patient in Argentina, they did a lot of work with, uh, you know, researchers did a lot of work figuring out what is up with these two. So anyway, 
The definition of an elite controller is someone who, whose own body has controlled HIV without any viral therapy, without any disease progression for more than 25 years. That is a really, really strict standard. So, I mean, we're po pretty much positive. I mean, anything can happen, but that these two women have cleared this on their own spontaneously without any drugs, without any help from anybody, but their own immune system. So to me, this is fascinating and offers everybody else uh, hope that, uh, that, you know, there's going to be something out there. And I think Jeff will talk about this deep latency that these two uh, women have, uh, have luckily have in, with their immune systems. Next slide. And I think this is where Jeff is going to start on why it is difficult to cure HIV. So my partner in crime, Jeff Taylor, please. Thank you, Linda. Um, great, great start to this. So yeah, I mean, the question is, why is it so difficult? I think many of us remember early on in the pandemic, um, there being projections that, oh, we're going to have this cured in a few years. Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine, mm -hmm. famously said he would come up with a cure. He died before he did. And all you know, 40 years later, we still don't have a cure. We're still looking for one and don't know what that's going to look like just yet. But next slide. So I think many of us remember, um, you know, the burst of hope that came with the, the cocktails, the protease inhibitors back in 1996. And um, David Ho famously was on the cover of Time because he predicted that if people took their meds long enough because they suppressed the HIV to, to undetectable levels at the, with the tests they had at the time, that the virus would just eventually go away. Well, that didn't, yes, we all know that didn't happen. If you stop your drugs, it comes roaring back um, as if you had never um, started drugs and um, you know, you're back to square one. So the reason for that is what we call the reservoir. So these are the places in the body where the virus hides out. So the brain, you know, which is kind of a privileged uh, site, we have something called the blood-brain barrier that keeps drugs, including HIV drugs, many of them, from getting into the brain to protect it from toxins in the environment. The same thing is true of the genital tract, the testes, ovaries. Um, the body tries to protect those from damage. And then other places like the lymph nodes, obviously, you know, anybody who's gotten HIV knows that one of the first signs is um, a swelling of the lymph nodes, and that's the HIV getting in there and the body's an inflammatory response to that. It's in the blood, obviously. And, you know, if you take your meds, um, that can go away. It's in the gut. That's a huge reservoir. Um, you know, because of all the uh, the biome that we have in the, the gut, we have a really strong immune system to make sure that those stay there and don't get into the uh, into your body. So uh, that's a huge place where the, the virus first starts and, and just uh, obliterates uh, many of the immune system cells and they don't always come back. And then of course the bone marrow. So um, that's where our, our blood cells come from, right? Both the, the white cells and the red cells. So those get infected. And as we mentioned earlier, the genitals. Um, next uh, slide, please. So what are we looking at? What pathways are we currently looking at to cure HIV? Next, next slide. So one is what they like to call kick and kill. And this is, as the name suggests, um, kind of waking up the virus because it goes into very, it integrates into all those reservoir sites, into cells and lies dormant or sleeps. It's in a latent, what they call a latent uh, state. And it's only until uh, you stop taking your meds or you get another infection that these cells can wake up and start multiplying. And then some on a low level um, keep multiplying anyway. You can't really see it. They don't get released into the blood, but there's some very low level um, replication happening. And this is the cause of the, uh, the inflammation that we hear about in HIV, which is why even if you're on meds and completely suppressed, people have higher levels of inflammation than somebody who doesn't have HIV. So the whole idea is to wake those cells up and then find ways to, to kill them using, um, you know, immune modulators, a vaccine, something like that. And uh, what, the way they do that is uh, a class of drugs that they call latency reversing agents. And these are things that are used a lot in cancer and have been really successful in cancer. The downside is um, two things. A, they can be really toxic. Chemotherapy, as we all know, is um, can be really toxic. And this is true of so far of the meds that they've looked at to date. And then the other issue is they don't always get every single cell. So we need more than just the kick. We need a kill. So you wake it up and we need, may need more than that. So that's one approach. Um, you know, we've been looking at it for a while from the first uh, 
I know the Delaney Collaboratories that Linda mentioned started uh, 12 years ago now. And that was one of the first things they're looking at. We're still, you know, we don't have any that are working. Um, so you know, the question remains, is that going to be part of a cocktail that we put together for cure research? Next slide. And another approach is broadly neutralizing antibodies. So as we all know, we have antibodies that our body produces to uh, respond to infections, be it the common cold, or in this case, HIV. And um, so, you know, people think, well, we must not have these for HIV because, uh, you know, you get sick. But the, the thing is, your body does try to mount a response. The problem is HIV, as we know, um, can, can mutate around this and becomes uh, resistant, not just to drugs, but to antibodies as well. But um, like the, the so-called elite controllers or long-term non-progressors that Linda was talking about, uh, many people do have better broadly neutralizing antibodies than others. So they can um, neutralize a, uh, a broad spectrum of, of HIV viruses. And so what scientists have done is, is to find these, to locate these people and um, isolate those antibodies that they produce and then put these together in a cocktail. So just one by itself doesn't work, um, but they put some together. They call them binabs if there's two, trinabs if three, and trying to create a kind of a cocktail of antibodies that will um, neutralize the virus that we find in you know certain geographic areas or in a certain person. So the hope is that they can find that are some that are broad enough that they can give them to everybody, um, but we're still working on that. And this is important because um, it can be part of a cure, but it can also be part of a long um, acting therapy. You know, we've got injectable drugs that can last two months now. We're looking at six months. The hope is that we can use these antibodies the same way. So you're not even taking drugs. You're, you have antibodies that are doing the job for you. So it might be both a way to um, treat HIV as well as to cure HIV. Next slide. So the next is cell and gene therapy uh, approaches. We talk about how these um, the virus integrates itself into your immune system cells, and that's why it's um, hiding out in the reservoir. It's so so hard to to get rid of. So the um, the cure cases that Linda was talking about, Timothy Ray Brown, the Berlin patient, Linda patient, um, all the rest. Um, as she mentioned, they all had um, bone marrow or stem cell transplants. And this was done to cure their HIV, um, not just their cancer, but their HIV. And uh, so what they do in this is they um, they do it in the body, which is on the left, that's called in vivo gene therapy. And in vivo is just a fancy way of saying in a living person. What they do is they take out um, the person's immune system cells, they genetically modify them so that they are resistant to HIV infection. And this is the same thing they did in those five cure cases that Linda talked about. Um, what they did in those cases is um, transplanted cells from people who had this very rare mutation that only existed mm -hmm. about 2% uh, mm -hmm. of the, the population and only in certain parts of the world, it, it seems like. So, but these people have something called a, um, a, a deletion on a part of their uh, the um, genome that is called Delta 32. And so people who have this rare mutation cannot be infected by HIV. Um, you know, we've known for a long time that there are certain people, no matter how much they're exposed to HIV, they don't get it. So these are the lucky few who have not one, but two copies from both parents of this rare gene. And so, you know, they go through the um, cell transplant um, donor banks to find these people, they screen for them, and these are the cells they use. So the idea in cell and gene therapy is to, to uh, do that um, without other people's cells, but modifying people's own cells uh, to do that. And the reason uh, they do that is because transplantation, as you know, has a lot of um, dangerous side effects and drawbacks. And one of those is rejection. If you're introducing somebody else's cells or an organ for that matter, if you get a, um, a liver transplant or kidney transplant, the body can reject those. So those cure cases, they all have to be on um, anti-rejection drugs, most of them for the rest of their life. So that you know puts up at risk for other cancers and, and side effects. So the whole idea is to bypass that altogether, um, use a lot of the new therapy, uh, new uh, techniques we have like CRISPR, which you heard about, to genetically modify our cells, put them back in uh, to the body, and hopefully this will help um, suppress the HIV naturally, just like it did in those five cure cases. So um, there's a lot. This is as you can see from the slide. It's it's really complicated. 
Uh, these are not things you can do in a doctor's office. This is only being done in, um, you know, cancer centers, basically. And so the question is, how do you um, scale, uh, make this scalable so everybody can get it? Because this will be way too expensive and way too uh, complicated to do, you know, even in resource uh, rich countries like the U.S., let alone um, all over the world, for the 38 million people living with HIV who need this cure. So let me go to the next slide and talk about um, the block and lock. So that deeper latency that uh, Linda was referring to in the so-called elite controllers who have HIV, but for whatever reason, their body manages to keep it under control and never really wakes up and um, is present in the bloodstream or causes any problems. So the whole idea is to um, stop the, the HIV from incorporating itself into the DNA of our own immune system cells. So, you know, that happens inside the cells. And um, HIV is a virus that um, it's not a DNA virus like uh, most other cells. They call it an RNA virus. And this is what's unique about HIV is that it needs human cells to replicate. It can't just replicate on its own. So it has to infect a human cell, usually an immune system cell, and um, take that RNA, which is just half of the um, genetic information, and turn it into DNA. And what happens in this block and lock um, technique is that they stop that from happening. Um, you know, we do this with therapy. That's how most of our HIV meds work. They do the same thing. And this is to get the body to do it on its own without med without medications so that that step never happens and the virus can never um, enter the cells and uh, replicate and cause problems. So there's, you know, this is a little bit farther behind than some of the other approaches, but it's a really appealing one because if they can figure out how to do this, um, it would probably be a lot simpler and a lot less toxic than some of the other therapies that are currently being uh, studied. Uh, next slide. So Linda mentioned uh, Harvard and uh, we love our friends at Harvard uh, because there is an institute there called the, uh, the Reagan Institute, which had a meeting about five years ago now to talk about um, you know, ethical ways to conduct um, studies. And one of the challenges in HIV research is we don't have the kinds of tests we need to find out if the tests are working. Either you have a viral load or you don't, but we don't know if the virus is going to rebound, if it's um, in other cells. So currently the state of the art which is imperfect doing AIDS research trials is to do what they call an analytic treatment interruption. And that's just a fancy way of saying you stop your meds and then you watch the people, you analyze them to see what happens. So this is being has to be done in a very controlled manner because we all know, we all have it drilled into our, our heads that if you uh, stop your medications, bad things will happen. Remember the SMART study and other research over the years. So this is you know kind of going against clinical recommendations but it's currently the only way we have to find out if these work. You know, and the end game is to be able to not take medications um, to see, and to have an effective cure. And so in these studies, we have to stop the medications. So um, this was a group of scientists, researchers, ethicists, and community who all got together in Boston for this meeting to kind of agree on how we should ethically and safely do this. So we came up with some inclusion criteria. So what people should be in these kind of studies uh, where they're going to stop their meds. So they had to have, you know, a good CD4 count. So over 500. They obviously had to have um, a viral load that was undetectable, unstable therapy. You know, their meds had to be working. And importantly, you know, a kind of caveat to this is they also had to make sure that if they um, stopped their medic, if they restarted their medications, they had other options in case they developed resistance to their current medications. So they couldn't be people who were long-term survivors with lots of history of failed regimens and things like that um, for safety reasons. And of course, they had to be otherwise healthy other than their HIV without major comorbidities, things like uh, past cancer, uh, being at risk for heart disease, things like that. Because as we mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of inflammation in people living with HIV, even if they are stably suppressed on um, their medications. Um, so those that inflammation can put them at higher risk. So we need to make sure it's screened carefully that people don't have any other underlying conditions that could be um, exacerbated by the uh, inflammation. Because once you stop your meds and the virus comes back, 
so does the inflammation and sometimes in a very big way if it rebounds very quickly. So we want to keep people very safe and not at risk for other bad things happening. And not only is that bad for the person in the trial, but it's bad for the field. Um, if you know people are getting other things, bad things happening to them in the context of a trial, that could shut it down and really set, uh, set back the research. So we need to be really cautious in uh, doing these early trials. <clears throat> Excuse me, next study. I mean, next study. <laughs> Next, next slide, please. <laughs> the studies on my brain. So these were the, you know, the key recommendations that came out of that meeting. So no active co-infections like hepatitis or TB. Um, no past, no active um, cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, lymphoma, or other virus-associated cancers. Um, no history of, of dementia, which we saw a lot in early uh, um, HIV or PML, which is really nasty. Um, as I mentioned, they can't have resistance to two or more classes of medications. So in the event that they um, you know, have to restart and the, vi the virus has developed any resistance to the medications that they were previously on, they have other options. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of new drug classes coming out. So that's um, making that simpler and, and making it uh, possible for more people to enter the trials. And as I mentioned, no history of cardiovascular events or being at high risk for cardiovascular disease heart attack, strokes, that sort of thing. Um, no history of AIDS-defining illnesses according to CDC criteria. So that's things like KS, PCP, a uh, number of other infections. And importantly, a history, no history of having a low a CD4 nadir, so your lowest ever CD4 count of less than 200 uh, during chronic stages of HIV. Because the problem is, if you stop your meds and the virus rebounds, often people go to where they were before. And so if that was really low, that puts them at risk um, for opportunistic infection. So they want people who've never been below uh, 200 CD4 counts, again, in these early studies, not for safety reasons. And then obviously women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, a lot of these drugs are really toxic, um, might cause fetal damage. So they don't want uh, to, to harm a fetus or a breastfeeding child. Um, nobody with advanced uh, liver disease, kidney disease, and uh, nobody, no children younger than two uh, for safety reasons. And, you know, most of these will be done in adults, but we want to make sure that at the same time, we're looking at kids living with HIV as, as well, because everybody's going to need these cures. Next slide. So Linda mentioned um, the Martin Delaney Collaboratories, and this is a, a number of um, research sites across these, the, uh, the world, actually, that are funded by the NIH. Um, it started uh, about 12 years ago with three sites. Uh, they are funded in five-year cycles. The next one had six. And now we have 10 in the most recent one that started two years ago. And this is a, a, a listing of, of where they all are. So, you know, they, they have cities uh, associated with each one, but they're not just in those cities. Uh, most of them have sites all over the country. They collaborate with researchers because they're trying to bring together a, a team of people to look at various aspects and create a pure research and find, um, kind of put together a, a cocktail, if you will, of various approaches. Because, you know, one thing, as we learned with the meds, one way of attacking the virus is not enough, has not been in the past. So they're looking at combining these and finding researchers looking at this. They partner with, um, with pharmaceutical companies that have uh, possible drugs or treatments that might be used for this. And uh, of course, they have uh, community advisory boards at each one. And Linda and I uh, represent two of those at uh, DARE and at RID. So um, these all have uh, websites. If you're interested in any of those um, and want to find one in your area, check it out, look them up online. And uh, next slide. Jeff, I've actually, actually, we wanted to they put this slide up to say that if you're interested in cure research, get in touch with these sites. And I put yeah. a link in the chat that oh, has, yeah. it's a NIAID link, but it has not only cure related cab opportunities, but prevention, um, mm. the ACTG that does treatment, you know, vaccines. So if you're interested, take a look at that, um, uh, at that link, because we could use all the help we can get at this point. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, a lot of us have been doing this for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, some of us, and um, we're getting older and <laughs> we need fresh blood. <laughs> By the minute. <laughs> 
And everybody needs a cure that affects people of all ages. And um, these other networks that Linda mentioned are looking at things like prevention as well. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of room for for young young blood to be uh, getting into this fight because we need uh, all the help we can get. And so we'd like, of course, to thank the people involved with this, um, the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition, um, AIDS Action Baltimore, Linda's group. Um, my group is the HIV and Aging Research Project. Um, tag and uh, the people who worked on these modules to help put together these slide decks and our biomedical co-leads. So Paula Cannon from the RIG Collaboratory and Nicolas Chaumont from the University of Montreal. So uh, we want to thank them all. And for, the DARE Collaboratory. Yeah, and the DARE Collaboratory as well. Yeah, we need all these uh, right. the, uh, logos on there. So that's it. And I think the only question that I saw as of a minute ago was if could pe people could get these slides and they they will at the end you know you know um our our dear friend Michael who is a wizard at all this stuff will send out information and links to all of this stuff to everybody that has registered so that will be um uh you know things will will be available to everybody now i think we're in good time michael do a you see any other questions? questions do we want to address those Okay, um, I I'm asking, asking Michael for some questions. Yeah, I haven't seen any of them yet, but I'm still trying to deal with uh, finding Paul. Okay. Okay. Well, in the meantime, I, since we're <laughs> finding yeah, one, I didn't here. see any. I'm here. I'm here. Can you Where hear me? You, Paul? He's here. Raise your hand for me. I'm here. Raise your hand. Raise, raise, your, your, see raise my hand on on. Okay. On we'll no, yes. raise your virtual hand so you get you'll be pulled up go. to the top, and I can do it. There I am. Let me so see. So the person that says there is no link. Yvonne, it's right under your name. You're that message. So keep scrolling down. It's it's uh, it Let's starts with www.hank.info. Okay. I and think we... it's the only link in there. But I don't know. Maybe it didn't go. There was a hiccup. That's why you lost me. Mm. There it is. It's in there now. There it is. So it should be the lay. I'm, I think stupidly I did not. I did not hit the. You know whatever. Uh, there it is. So for now, now it's the last one. There's the link. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Okay, I don't really so see. Here's the question. Um, percent oh, you go ahead, Michael. I see a couple. Of um, what is the percentage of people who of African descent with the Delta thirty two mutation? Eh. Eh. Probably Zero. Probably Very nobody. Low, yeah. It's Northern Europe is the place yes. where these these mutations are found. Actually, one uh, interesting point about that. So the um, the New York patient was a person of mixed race. And so they were able to get this by a, a new um, thing they're doing in, in cure research. So not only did they get a donor that was matched, but didn't have, um, there was an adult donor who donated stem cells um, who matched them genetically, but didn't have this um, mutation. But the other half of, of the cells they got were from um, um, the umbilical cord at birth from somebody who did have that. So they're finding that they can combine those two, and this will be a way to provide, um, you know, this kind of cure research to people of all ethnicity, which is really important because yeah, you know, we first we're also working with. The, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Jeff. We're well, also there, working there, with. The, you go. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say there was there was concern at first that this would only apply to people of um of European oh, descent. That's not yeah, the case. Yeah, yeah. We're also working with a group in Africa that is trying to bring gene therapy to that continent as well. And they're doing a really great job. They are, they're, their initial emphasis is um, sickle cell disease, but they're, they're actually working with, um, with uh, UCSF, which is where DARE is located. Uh, and they are having some of their docs come to see how some of this work is done. And, you know, they're kind of mentoring them. And there is also another group that is involved with this group that has an, um, a wonderful idea about how to much more reasonably uh, get the, you know, these therapies to other countries um, in the developing world much more reasonably than the costs here. And that involves, you know, a lot of times these products are frozen and they have to be shipped and all of this, it's just an exorbitant expense. But what they're doing is um, building the capacity in countries, and it's, you know, that's the thought anyway, and it's happening in one country in Africa, maybe two, to build the capacity to actually create the 
the, the necessary um, interventions in that country. And if they've actually shown that they're more effective if they're not frozen. So they're building that capacity now. And, and actually Gates is very interested in making sure that if we get a hit, that it'll be available across the globe. There's also some questions about what we mean by Delta 32 and CCR5. Are they the same thing? What is that meaning beside, behind those numbers? And then we have, I see your hand, Scott. I'll get to okay. you. So the thing of it is, and Jeff kind of mentioned this, you know, so you have your, your immune system cells. The CD4 is vital to fighting infections and stuff. And the bad news about um, uh, HIV is it it jumps on that CD4 and fits like a lock in a in hand in a glove or into the lock and it gets it combines with that cell and as jeff said it actually becomes a part of that cell which makes it a lot more like cancer than something like like hcv which is an infection that you can kill just with drugs so that's what um this and the ccr5 is you know what uh what are you jeff you want to take the second half of it yeah, so the CCR, there's two receptors on our T cells that HIV can use to um, to infect the cell. And the most common one um, way to get in, uh, for those cells to get infected is through that CCR5. And so with the Delta 32 that I was talking about, it's kind of complicated, which is why I didn't go into it. But if you have a mutation at that site on the the um, the gene your genome, you don't have a CCR5. That CCR5 cannot be um attached to by the HIV and it cannot be infected. So that's why it's important. And I think I'd just like to say before we move on, for me, and this is my bias, I mean, I think trying to wake this up is crazy, okay? Let sleeping dogs lie. Why wake it up in somebody's brain? Um, I think that um, that the, the monoclonal, I mean, the, the BNABs have, have really, we thought would be a lot more successful. They're gonna be, I think, very helpful for prevention and treatment, but, I mean, I think the hope was that it would work like a vaccine and, and not only deliver uh, an antibody, but that these antibodies would keep on growing and be there and last forever. And it just doesn't seem to be panning out. You know, the, the, the gene therapy is very, very high risk, but it may be that you do this once or twice and that's it. And I love the, the block and lock, which is, is really, as Jeff said, the farthest uh, away. And uh, I mean, they, they just came up with them. Um, looked at one drug that 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 had the, the possibilities with this was very, very toxic. So they're just starting on another one that um, that may give us this this, you know, tamp down this latency. I mean, you know, you have shingles, you have other diseases, you don't wake them up, you try and keep them latent, you know. Why? To me, it makes the most sense, but it's the, probably the hardest and the farthest away. So we had a question from Scott. Scott, did you want to come off mute and ask your question or comment? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to uh, engage a little bit about the zero uh, Delta 32 in Africa. Africa is a, a big place, and uh, as we all know, and highly diverse. And uh, you know, there's it is more common in Europe, but it, it is present in, in East Asia and parts of Africa. There's a lot of studies out there, some of which have said zero uh, prevalence, but uh, there are others that have gone looking for it and studied it and found, you know, one to two percent of people have it. And um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, if, if uh, people are... Um, I didn't want people to be discouraged about there being absolutely no Delta 32 in, in parts of the world. Um, so they're definitely more, more prevalent, more, more uh, present in uh, Europe than in other regions, but it is it has been found in um, Central and East Asia and in Africa as well. So I don't, I don't want to... Uh, uh, go out of my way to contradict anyone. I just want to um, offer uh, some reassurance that it's it's not completely absent from other populations. So Thanks, Scott. That's very helpful. Also, I wanted to point out, I put it into the chat. We had an event with Paula Cannon and David Baltimore, the Nobel laureate, and they discussed 
where this CCR5 Delta 32 mutation may have come from, where it seems like that that was asked at a, a live event that we did. So if you want to look, check, check out the link in the chat. Yeah, that's a very interesting history. Well, you know, uh, I think without further ado, we're pretty we're, we're pretty doing pretty well on time. Melanie and and Paul, maybe you could take the last part of the session and just tell us what is the most important thing for your community in in, in cure research. And and if you want to relate anything or pose any questions about the the presentation, that would be fine. So, ladies first, is that okay? Melanie, would you like to go first, please? Okay. Um Cure research for uh, women and African Americans. Uh, for myself, I didn't think it was important because um, I just wanted for myself my virus to be uh, suppressed and taking medication since I have taken medication since I was born. I mean, that's just a regular thing for myself, um, that medication, being adherent and taking, making sure you're adherent and going to your appointments. Uh, and then U equals U and treatment as prevention. I was uh, comfortable with that until... The end, the HIV epidemic of funds and funding and uh, taking away from treatment and care and those services to end the um, HIV epidemic, I started to think, what's going to happen to those of us who are still here? You're ending the epidemic, but then we already have HIV. And we're going to still be here. There was no mention of what was going to happen to those of us already living with HIV. And that's when the aha here, we have got to push this cure. Uh, and uh, that we have to put all our efforts into cure and uh Whatever we have to do to get people who are hesitant about uh, research, being a participant, uh, studying it, we have to educate them that this is going to be life-saving for us. And we should be concerned about where they are in cure research, who is who are the ones who are allowed into um, the uh, studies, the exclusion. I was a bubble baby, so I'm all automatically excluded. And I found out when I was 65 that I had uh, a congenital heart issue that could at any time create a, a cardiac arrest. So I I have a lot of things that would leave me out, but I can still encourage others to be involved and to get interested. Um, and uh, those of us who have uh, been living with um, HIV for a long time, my I've been 24 years. Um, I had to fight for four years to get on ART because the CDC recommendations were uh, if you were above 350 CD4 and you are less than um, 20,000 viral load, you don't need it. Uh, and I fought and fought because I had taken medication all my life. I said, I know it'll be for the rest of my life. I know how to, t uh, to do that. And please let me get it because I didn't want my disease to progress. And at the time, uh, it had not been declared a manageable uh, chronic disease. So I wanted to be around as long as I could. Um, and uh, so I finally got it and started with three pills. Then I went to two pills and now I'm on one pill. And um, 
I take all kinds of other pills for other conditions that I have. So getting a, an injection, you know, that doesn't excite me uh, because I still have all these other pills I have to take on a daily basis. Right. So I just say for our community, we have to get over uh, medical distrust, being used as a guinea pig, being used as an experiment. We are trying to to just live a high quality life. And if it takes the cure to help us do that, because even though quality of life is part of the new NAS, uh, they don't get really what quality of life is. Because actually for each one of us, there's a little bit of difference between them. <clears throat> but they don't have the funds to do the things that need to happen for us to have a high quality of life. And so that my, that in the HIV epidemic changed my whole outlook and perspective on cure research. You know, the old timers of us who have been around like for so forever, Jeff and I, I mean, we've gone through, you know, the, the, so many people being excluded or, you know, it's just that, and it, this is our community. We get, we got there first. We had, we knew about things. We were connected to hospitals. People have more computers to find these things. And it, it's always the people of color that get left behind. So we have really vowed to ourselves and made it our mission to make sure that to level this playing field at this point, to do whatever we can to include people on our cabs in these trials so that they're, you know, I never, for, for one, never push, you should get in this trial. That's up to you to decide, okay? Because these can be very risky. But I want, it's my job to make sure that you know that they exist and that you can talk mm -hmm. to your doctor about it and decide. So we, we really worked really hard to try and make, the, make it a, a much more even playing field. Jeff, did you want to say anything? Okay, no. I'll, go Paul. <laughs> <clears throat> so much um this you know we did this seven was it a year and a half ago two years ago when you guys presented to our 50 plus guys a little bit over here a, a, a long time been a while and the first thing that surprised me in the seminar was what and i hear this from a lot of clients um we don't want to be cured why why don't they want to be cured because they haven't worked in 35 and 40 years their housing is covered their medical care is covered. Their food is covered. Um, they don't know what they would do if they had to go back to work. I mean, there's all of those concerns. Um, I'm on the long acting injectables. I just started them in February. Um, and I agree with you, Melanie. It is a small thing when you have other medications you have to take every day, but um, I don't have a problem with those. There is a phenomenon that they're discovering at Word 86 where it's just this resentment about HIV meds, taking it for so long, especially with long-term survivors. Um, and so there's a med compliance issue. Um, the thing with the cure that I hear a lot of people talk about is, um, you know, there are still 38.5 billion million people in this on this planet living with HIV and you're right distributing that cure would be a challenge um, I think uh, I don't think anybody in our group really plans to see that in their lifetime a cure I don't um, so the next best thing is the long acting for those who are just on one med you know one pill a day um, I don't rattle when I walk anymore so that's nice uh, <laughs> yes, he does. You <laughs> age does that, not the pill. Uh, uh. But um, I mean, the the research is exciting. I mean, Adam and Timothy, and I mean that is extreme, but there is hope that it can be done. That's just really extreme. Not everybody can get a you know uh, bone marrow transplant. That's kind of extreme. Um, and so I, I look forward to see, you know, what comes out of all of this research. I know that some of, um, one of the criteria, as I said 
earlier in there that Jeff was sharing, I don't meet that criteria because my T cells have never been over 200, ever. So I don't meet that criteria immediately like that. So I don't know how you're going to find people to participate with those criteria so restrictive. Um, and I think well, that's Let me that's just gonna... say, Paul, let me just give you some good news that it's looking like it may be possible not to have to do that analytic treatment interruption to take people off of their antivirals. Yeah. And, and believe me, that is not around the corner. But we finally got some hope in that direction. So it may be, if you have those diseases or conditions, it may be a problem. But some of the other stuff may not be a problem. So don't right. give up. I, I totally agree with you, Denise. You're right. HIV in the general workplace is not very well supported. People don't, um, you know, I mean, we, we have that problem with medical professionals now who don't, aren't culturally competent to understand what we long-term survivors have walked through because they're all retiring and taking that with them. Mm -hmm. And then this new group coming in, they don't get it. You know, they're like, you know, what? So you watch your entire community die in front of your eyes. We don't, you know, they don't get it. Um, and workplaces are the same thing. Um, there is still that stigma. And I think a cure might um, diminish that stigma. I don't think it'll ever be gone totally because people are judgmental the way they are. Um, yeah. So, and I hear you, Zhao, that it is an affirming thing that you're fighting this invader. Um, 38 years here, tired of fighting. <laughs> Just tired of fighting it. Um, that's why, you know, the long, the, as an aside, the long acting injectables I'm on are the lenacapavir, which they just approved in December. And I'm actually, I fell out of the, um, the criteria, but my lovely doctor, Dr. Monica Gandhi, decided she was going to go with this. And even though my viral load wasn't suppressed, Within two months after on them, I was I am now suppressed, and the numbers that they're doing in San Francisco with this uh, the Cabinuva and the Lenacapavir um, are maintain exactly what Gilead's numbers are. It's the same from what their original studies were with their original research, so it's looking good, um, and that is hope for the most vulnerable population that we have in San Francisco, which is homeless people with HIV this is a game changer for them to get them to be virally suppressed. Um, so we're excited about that. And let's just imagine if they had to come once a year, you know, they might exactly. forget that's the bad news, but yeah. well, you know, you know no, I'll, tell you what. I'll tell you what, word 86 is they, I don't know how they do it. These they're amazing with folks that are on the, the cabin of once a month or every other month, they're in there and they are, they, they keep track of them. They, they will go out and find these folks if they you know are a little i mean they're, they're just amazing at how they're doing it i'm i'm really impressed with them keeping track of the patients that they have on this because they know that this is a game changer for folks who you know whose encampments get torn down and their meds are taken and the whole bit mm -hmm. you know it's it's uh, exciting i also want you to know that we have never forgotten that what we learned those couple of years ago in our first couple of presentations with the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And we have made it our second goal to never stop talking about this to doctors and to, to look ahead at the policy implications of this mm -hmm. to make sure that when this does happen, we're thinking about it way before. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, the policies so have to be in place. I think it that's a so key thing. The policies need to be in place when this exactly. happens to support getting people back into, I mean, we're doing that with the workforce training program at the at the foundation. Of course, I was the first one to join that program, but you know, there's too many people who are our age who haven't worked in 30 years, who aren't paying into social security, and all of a sudden their disability switches over and now they have to go back to work because they can't afford to pay the rent. It's crazy, it's crazy. 
And I think another oh, yeah. thing to keep in mind is that um, as wonderful as a cure will be, if and when it happens, it's not going to erase all the damage that HIV has done to right. our body over the years mm-hmm. or, you know, to our psyches, right? So we're right. going to be kind of a, a population out there that has PTSD, that has these things. And so we that's part of the policy things we should be advocating for. Yeah. We don't want them to just say, okay, now it's cured, kick you off disability, and um, don't worry about what's happening to your, to your bodies anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we got it down to one pill a day, it kind of happened like that, too. I mean, the general mm-hmm. public, like, they think it's gone. Right. They thought and that was a cure. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people think there's a vaccine. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, when because, you talk about stigma, yeah, if you do any HIV decrim work, mm-hmm. you find how many people still think and believe that the HIV epidemic is still AIDS and exactly. it's still uh, homophobic. It's still prom- promiscuous. Uh, they have no clue. They don't buy into science. They don't believe it. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so disheartening. You know, it's important. That's the, that's the work that Valerie Wojciechowicz has been doing is really important about the stigma, the language and the stigma around it that, you know, it's, it's so key to getting the general public to understand where we're at with HIV now. Yes, it's a chronically managed disease, but, you know, AIDS is still there, too. Yes, but, but the they don't, don't go hand recognize in hand. the term HIV. Right. It's AIDS. AIDS. One of my pet peeves is is in reading documentation. There's always people who HIV forward slash AIDS, and psychologically, they're linked when you do that. So I always have to go and correct and go HIV and AIDS, or HIV and or AIDS. Just to, I know it's a small thing, but you know it does set that that. What am I trying to say? It shows that it's not, you know, one does not mean you have to have the other. You know. Okay. Well, we are at the hour here. Um, This was amazing, you guys. Thank you so much for helping us out. I mean, we love to hear hear your perspective. I think it's so important. And we picked two right people, Jeff, right? (laughs) And we would like to tell, to remind you that we're going to have another session next month and that's going to talk that's going to cover that's going to be on the 11th same time july the 11th and we're going to talk yeah. about some of the exclusion criteria and age sort of considerations and the, some of the stuff that there are a lot of the stuff that uh, excludes long-term survivors and how what we're trying to do to change that age that age barrier at, at least so i mean yeah. we can't do it for a lot of things because we don't want to hurt people I mean, that's the first consideration but, um, you know, we're going to talk about the age stuff next time. And, and as I said, the exclusion criteria. So thank you again for joining us. Jeff, any last words? No, terrific job. Thank you so much, Melody and Paul. This has been terrific. It was really thank good. You, thank you so much. Thank you Our all pleasure. for coming. Anytime. You know, I'm yeah, the, I'm I hope you will join us do. again next time. Yes. Yeah. And thank you, Definitely. Scott, for being with us and giving us some new information. It's new to some of us. So. Yes. We appreciate you being here. Thank you too, Michael. All righty. That's it. See you next month. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Paul's the grand master. So far, no M-Pox. Yay. What? For San Francisco. Paul won one time. Oh, congratulations, Paul. I think he's the 19th person in the history of Pride to be named that, and he got it as a long-term Named what? Tell us what. I didn't hear, Vince. Lifetime Achievement Grand Marshal for San Francisco Pride. Oh, yes. That is fabulous. Which mm-hmm. means after Pride, I get to retire, right? Because Lifetime no, Achievement. No. <laughs> Ask no. your boss. <laughs> Darn. Practice that yeah. way. Uh, that's it. The there you go. I love that. Well, look, congratulations. Uh, that's wonderful to hear. Thanks for coming. Uh, okay. And thank you again for helping us out. Thank really you. Good. Bye. All right. Y'all take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.